Yeah, yeah. let's just start with simple stuff. You know, what's it like having the Prime Minister here and you guys being here as well? Actually, um, I, I'm Mr. Bill Blair, Mr. Randy Bossano. We're here and we're going to be joined very shortly by uh, the Prime Minister. But one of the purposes for coming here is we know that the wildfires that have been impacting um, the people of Alberta have been very significant. People have been displaced from their homes. There's a great deal of concern. Um, we received a request from the province to provide federal assistance through a request for assistance arrangement, and the Canadian Armed Forces, as they always do, have stepped up um, in order to provide that support. And so we're here, frankly, to talk, talk to the, 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 the soldiers about some of the important work that they're doing here in Alberta, and also to offer our sincere thanks, because we know their commitment, their dedication, and their expertise is really going to make a difference for people over. As Bill said, our government cares about what's happening to Albertans. We responded when Fiona uh, took place, when the floods in Calgary took place, when the devastating Fort McMurray wildfires happened. And look, we're talking about still 20,000 people evacuated and uh, people's livelihoods, their farms, their animals, their very livelihood is, is at stake. And in some cases, we've seen you know communities devastated by this fire. So we're here because we care, we're supporting. We've got 300 uh, CF personnel on the ground in Alberta and the whole of the government of Canada is responding to make sure that Albertans are safe and that Albertans know that we care but that when a disaster of this magnitude strikes the federal government is there to respond in in close collaboration with the government of Alberta. I'd also take the opportunity to, to mention that the, the Canadian Red Cross, the federal government and the provincial government have, have agreed to a matching fund so that with the incredible generosity of Canadians right across the country and certainly here in Alberta who are donating money to the Canadian Red Cross, both the province and the federal government are going to match it. And so far, cumulatively between the three of us, over $10 million has been raised. Uh, raised. Uh, that will continue over the, over the coming weeks until the, until the first week in June. Um, and we believe that that money can be used very effectively to help support people um, who have been displaced from their homes, who are, who are dealing with a very, very difficult situation, and also su provide support to a wide variety of community organizations who are there for Albertans during this time of incredible need. And I guess uh, the weather, it looks like it's going to continue like this. Are you guys ready to keep offering aid? Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest with you, the, the weather, um, as I think it's been an extraordinary factor in these fires. What we've seen is very high temperatures, conditions, on, you know, beautiful, it's a beautiful sunny day here in Edmonton, but at the same time, these are actual conditions that give rise to a very significant likelihood of increased fire activity. Um, that's, the fire activity here in Alberta has begun earlier than normally expected. Um, there is, you know, it, it, it's almost without precedent to have this level of act fire activity in the province. Um, certainly, I, we've looked, we, we track very carefully. I, I watch weather reports, mm -hmm. like I used to watch crime reports. Um, but, but weather reports are, are very significant. It appears that these hot, dry, windy conditions could prevail over, over several days. And so clearly we are here for the long haul. And I think it's important to acknowledge we know that those firefighters who have noted they're doing an extraordinary and courageous job for all of us, they're going to get tired, they're going to need, they're going to need uh, uh, replacements. And so we're, we're working very closely with not just other provinces across the country, but other countries, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, um, and Mexico to see if we can draw other firefighters to bring them here to assist the Canadian Armed Forces, to, to assist you know, the wildfire the, uh, fire fighters um, here in Alberta. Um, we also have in, see, significant challenges. There are fires burning in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Northwest Territories. And so we, we know that there's still more resources going to be required. And the relationship of the government, the federal government to the provincial governments is we provide the support that's needed as long as it's needed and uh, well past when this time when this makes headlines. So we need to work with uh, the provincial, our provincial counterparts to make sure that the fires are out. We're talking 84 fires, 27 are still out of control. We're still almost 20,000 people out of their homes. So there's still a lot of work ahead and, and the, the hot, dry conditions are making uh, this challenging for firefighters, but these are professional firefighters and they're boosted now by some 300 personnel from the Canadian Armed Forces. So we're in this for the long haul. And, and just to be clear before I ask the question, the, the province of Alberta is responsible for the emergency response here to this very difficult and challenging situation. Our responsibility is to be here in support of them, and we're working very closely with the province, and through, certainly through the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre, our Government Operations Centre, our officials are working in extremely close collaboration to make sure that the federal government is here in support of the important work that the province is doing. How is the government going to help those who have lost houses? Well, 
da damage is, is eligible for reimbursement. Now, the, the, it's the province's responsibility to design and implement a financial assistance arrangement to assist those individuals. And the federal government has what we call, and I manage this, a disaster financial assistance arrangement, where certain uh, expenses are eligible for reimbursement by the federal government. And so what it requires is, is the province to establish a, 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 a assistance arrangement, and we work very closely with them, and they'll do that. And they're well aware of the eligibility criteria, and for events of this magnitude, where there's, there is significant damage and, and loss of up to 90% of, of those um, recovery expenses can be reimbursed by the federal government, but we, it, it, it really is initiated by the province. Uh, we also know that those things take time, and it can cause some frustration and anxiety among Canadians. I just want to assure them that in, in the initial response, both orders, all orders of government, and that includes the municipalities, will be there for them. And as we go through a period of, of recovery, we'll work very closely with the province to make sure that the resources are there. Not, not just, in, certainly to help people with their businesses, their homes, um, their, their, their valued possessions, but also the impact that it can have on critical infrastructure, um, where, where water treatment plants and mm -hmm. other things can be destroyed in some of these municipalities, and we want to make sure that we can get those up and running as quickly as possible. And we want to just, maybe before we wrap up, just let everyone know we're sending our thanks and gratitude to all the first responders, and we're here to thank all the members of the Canadian Armed Forces who have responded to this call from the government of Alberta, and we want to thank them and their families for standing up for Albertans and fellow Canadians at, their, at this time of need. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Questions, question oral. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Canadians are unable to access basic services and our streets are being roamed by violent, repeat offenders and housing and food costs are out of control. And where has the Prime Minister been? Well, so far this year he's been on five luxury vacations. It's as if he doesn't care at all. So is the Prime Minister's only interest in Canada that Canadians are picking up the tab for these luxurious vacations? Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, as the member knows, the Prime Minister did go uh, on vacation in Christmas uh, with his family to a friend's house. The member's opposite obsession uh, with the Prime Minister personally is, of course, driven by a partisan interest. But, Mr. Speaker, there are a great number of things in front of this House uh, that have an enormous impact on Canadians' day-to-day -day life. Uh, whether or not it's our dental care plan, whether or not it's the investments we're making in housing or to lift people from homelessness. Mr. Speaker, I would say that there's a lot better issues to be focusing on. Yeah. Member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, Rita Lakes. These Liberals are out of touch, Canadians are out of money, and often we find that the Prime Minister is out of the country. And meanwhile, an entire generation of Canadians have given up on ever owning a home. So while the Prime Minister is jet-setting and spending three months' average rent on a single-night hotel room, Canadians are wondering whether or not they're going to be able to keep the lights on and be able to feed their families. So when will the Prime Minister step out of the luxury suite and step up for Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Diversity and Inclusion. Mr. Speaker, the reason why they're focusing on the Prime Minister is to cover up for their lack of a housing plan. We've been working hard every single day to make sure that more and more Canadians have access to a safe and affordable place to call home. We've, uh, we've put investments in place to help renters to pay the rent. We've put investments in place to build more supply. And what do they do? They vote against it, come to this house, focus on the Prime Minister, and then pretend to care about housing, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rita Lakes. Well, no one has ever spent as much to achieve so little as that housing minister and these Liberals. The only thing that seems to get them out of bed in the morning to support their Prime Minister is to make sure that his next taxpayer-funded trip is paid for by Canadians. He's been out of the country on vacations, his most recent one, paid for by, donation, uh, by a donor to the Trudeau Foundation. And now he's tuning up the jet to head off again next week. So while drug use and crime rage, food bank use soars, is the Prime Minister ready to park the taxpayer-funded jet and step up for Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, uh, at 
a time when we're facing the challenges of uh, really the existential challenge of climate change, at a time when we're dealing with the worst inflation crisis that this planet has faced in a very long time, it doesn't matter that Canada is leading the world. It's ahead of the G7. It's ahead of the average of the, both the G7, the G20, the Eurozone, Japan. We are now having it down uh, uh, below 5 percent. But the member now is suggesting that going to the G7 and representing our nation amongst G7 nations to talk about the future is a vacation and that he should not be there. It shows just how out of touch the party across the way is, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, this government is out of touch. After eight years of this government, everything is more expensive. And now it wants to impose a 41 cents a litre tax on gas. Our farmers are suffering from an increase in the price of inputs and fuel. Processors and distributor distributors are also exasperated. And 1.5 million Canadians are now going to food banks. In fact, at moisson Beauce, in my riding, there's been an increase of 27.5%. The government's role should be simple, to ensure that Canadians can put food on the table. When will this government understand that enough is enough? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague should know that our government is there to help farmers. We have improved the advanced payments program, which enables farmers enables farmers to get no interest loans of up to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We have also improved our program for good agricultural farm practices, and we have also signed with Quebec and the other provinces and territories our partnership agreement. $367 million for Quebec. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Beauce. Mr. Speaker, I think the Minister has her head in the clouds because what Canadians want is tangible solutions to the crisis and the cost of living. This government prefers to increase taxes and watch Canadians starve. There is a very clear report on food prices for 2023. A four-person family will have to spend 1065 additional dollars to feed themselves. When will this government show some good sense? When will it commit to not imposing more taxes? I want a date, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure my colleague saw this, but last week I called upon a new bid for tender for the local food initiative this is a fund that will help community gardens, community greenhouses, food banks, seniors programs, everyone who is involved in our food system on a local and regional level. All those stakeholders can now submit their financial projections all through the Agriculture and Agri-Food Department. The Honourable Member for, for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to follow what the Liberals are saying about the Century Initiative and its objective of increasing the population to 100 million. On the one hand, they say they reject the initiative, but on the other, they are refusing to support our motion, which rejects the initiative. So on the one hand, they're saying they will not set the same targets as that initiative, 500,000 people a year, but on the other hand, their own target for 2025 is 500,000 people. So they say they're closing the door to the Century Initiative, but actually they're leaving it wide open, and they're doing the same thing. Do they think Quebecers will be fooled by this? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, let's be very clear. The Century Initiative is not government policy. The government does not adhere to the conclusions of that independent group. The government's objective is not to increase Canada's population to 100 million. We have announced our immigration targets for the next three years. Those targets were set as a function, Mr. Speaker, of the needs of Canadians and Quebecers. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to believe the Liberals when they say they're not drawing inspiration from the Century Initiative because their immigration targets are identical. But let's give them a chance. We still don't know what their targets will be for after 2025, so perhaps they will not copy the Century Initiative's targets after 2025. So, my next question, will they commit before Quebecers to ensuring that their targets from 2026 will be under the Century Initiative target of 500,000 people a year? Or, on the contrary, will they confirm through their silence that they are indeed copying the Century Initiative? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we'll repeat it once more for the Bloc Québécois to properly understand it. The Century Initiative is not government policy. 
and the Black Capricorn should stop fear mongering. And secondly, as the Black Capricorn knows very well, we are the level of government that gives the most money to Quebec for helping immigrants learn fresh French. We are there with millions of dollars a year to work with the government of Quebec to ensure that immigrants coming to Quebec will be able to speak French. And on this side of the house, Mr. Speaker, we will always be there to defend Quebec's interests. North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, the poppy helps us commemorate the sacrifice and bravery of the women and men who served in the Canadian Armed Forces. Canadians are proud to wear their poppy in remembrance. But not Conservative Premier Daniel Smith. Oh. She's picking a fight with veterans to try and score political points for herself. Shame. It's Shame. shameful. Shame. Will the minister stand up for veterans and condemn the remarks of Daniel Smith? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question. It's so important that we pay respect to our veterans. We have and always will. What we have to do is pay respect to our veterans and make sure that we support our veterans. I can assure you on both issues that what this government is doing and will continue to do. Thank you for the question. Just, uh, I just want to remind folks to make sure that our questions and comments are about government, federal government issues uh, for, for things that are actually in the heart. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Canada's corporate watchdog is responsible for ensuring that Canadian companies act ethically abroad. Yet in five years, with an annual budget of millions of dollars, no investigations have been done to protect Indigenous people, the environment, or human rights. This failure allows bad companies to act with impunity. This harms Canada's reputation, and it makes Canadian companies implicit, complicit in rape, in murder, and in the destruction of Indigenous communities. I put forward legislation that would strengthen corporate responsibility. When will the Liberals do what they always do, copy the NDP work, and fix the core? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for, this, uh, for her question. Um, at the very heart of Canada's trade policy is an inclusive trade policy. At the very heart of our policy is responsible business conduct. We, for the very first time, appointed a ombudsperson for corporate responsibility. She is she has set up shop. She is doing her work. I look forward to working with uh, my honourable colleague and with all members here uh, to ensure that Canadian businesses operating anywhere around the world is operating with those high standards led by Canadian values. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for uh, Selkirk Interlake Eastman, sure. Mr. Speaker, instead of addressing their passport and immigration backlogs, these Liberals are disrespecting our veterans and Canadian Armed Forces who protect our sovereignty and freedom. The government's useless and unnecessary passport redesign will erase the image of Vimy Ridge, the place where Canada came of age and first fought as a unified force. How do these Liberals explain to our veterans and Canadians who served our country that their sacrifice is not even worth one page on our passports? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of Immigration. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, so just for everyone to know, every 10 years the government updates their passports to actually protect Canadians from fraudsters and ensure it's hard to counterfeit them. Mr. Speaker, this is not a partisan issue. This is about ensuring Canadians get the most secure and reliable passports they can use around the world. And the Conservatives just don't get that. For Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Well, that member doesn't get it that we get to sit in here because of the sacrifice made by our veterans. Yeah, that's right. The brave Canadians who served at Finney Ridge are not the only ones that are getting caught up in the Liberals' cancel culture. From Terry Fox to Nellie McClung, famous Canadians are being erased from our passports. With our rich history and culture, you would think that the iconic beaver might actually get a mention in this uh, passport, but instead they went with squirrel holding a nut. Does this government really think that all Canada has to offer are underrepresented rodents? Yeah. 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 Government House Leader. One of the greatest darknesses ever known to man began to uh, cast its shadow over Europe. Canada responded in an unprecedented way, sending tens upon tens of thousands of men into harm's way. Every single one of us, viscerally, and deeply understands the sacrifices that they make and made 
at that point and that those in our armed forces make now on behalf of democracy. There isn't a person in this House who isn't seized by that. How we honour it, the ways in which we recognise it may differ, but let us never question our commitment to that cause, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Moose Jaw, Lake Centre, Lanigan. Mr. Speaker, every year Canadians of all stripes travel to France to honour those that made the ultimate sacrifice at Vimy Ridge. I myself have made that trip in a place where Canada defined itself as a nation and a place that unites us all. That is why everyone was stunned, including veterans like myself, that this government has decided that they need to wipe it and other important symbols that define our nation from the new passport design. When will this minister reverse course and stop trying to erase Canadian history? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, it's important that we understand history and what took place when a honourable colleague's party was in power. In fact, they slashed a thousand employees from Veterans Affairs. They slashed funding to Veterans Affairs. They slashed funding to commemorative program. They slashed 17% from the commemorative program, which includes Vimy Ridge. And I was at Vimy Ridge a few weeks ago and I announced $12 million to make sure that the commemorative program uh, continues as it should. We have and always will respect veterans and make sure we attend to veterans as properly as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Chief. The Honourable Member of Moose Jaw Lake Centre Lanigan. Well, Mr. Speaker, it was this Prime Minister that said veterans were asking for too much. That's right. The Legion was disappointed, saying that removing the image was a poor decision. The Vimy Ridge Foundation, whose mission is to teach Canadian shared history, said they are disappointed, especially with the decision coming just after a month after the 106th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Mr. Speaker, was the Minister of Veterans Affairs consulted on this change? Is he okay with with this government trying to erase the memory and sacrifices of Canadian veterans? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. If this Prime Minister that decided we would reverse the track that the previous government was on, on slashing veterans' funds, on closing veterans' offices right across the country, on slashing funds to commemorative programs in Europe, we have, Mr. Speaker, and this government has put $2 billion extra per year in the pockets of veterans. We have to and make sure that we uh, treat veterans properly because that is why we're able to say what we like in this House. We have and will continue to support veterans, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lévis Le Bignard. Mr. Speaker, once again, this Liberal government is doing whatever it wants and having the gall to eliminate symbols that are dear to Canadians from the new version of the Canadian passport. Mr. Speaker, instead of respecting those who fought for our liberty, why is this government just following its whims and sacrificing these images that mean freedom for thousands of Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, do you know what the Conservatives are good for? They are very good at dividing Canadians using fear-mongering and divisive rhetoric. This passport update that is being used to protect Canadians from fraud, they're trying to turn it into a culture war. Mr. Speaker, they're trying to bring Trump's culture wars to Canada. We will not be influenced by that. We will continue to help our veterans, just as the minister said. And symbols will always be respected in Canada. The Honourable Member for lévis le Mr. Speaker, the government's design for the passport to replace historic symbols by representations of heritage is just not acceptable. It's an affront and shows a real lack of respect for veterans. Will this government show some respect or judgment and redesign this so-called modern version of the passport? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian passport is one of the most trustworthy travel documents in the world, as we all know. We can celebrate our history in this House and throughout Canada in many, many ways. And we can also ensure that our passports... I think we're losing the narrative here because the important thing is that our passports must be secure. 
And that's what we're doing. We will continue to commemorate Canada's history without compromising travelers' safety. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister claims that he was unaware of threats against the member for Wellington Halton Hills in 2021. No one actually believes that, but let's pretend that we do. This morning, the Globe and Mail revealed that CSIS had an extremely thick file against the expelled Chinese diplomat. He had been taking photos and tracing dissidents for the Chinese regime, interfering with Liberal Minister staff to distance them from the pro-Taiwan movement. According to the Globe and Mail, Global Affairs and the PMO knew all that since 2020. Why did they wait until this Monday to expel the diplomat? The Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, we take the issue of foreign interference very seriously. And of course, we will not accept foreign interference in our democracy. That's why after thoughtful reflection, after balancing all the various possible consequences judiciously, but also considering our principles and with pragmatism, we decided to act. We took a decision after after calling in the ambassador, and we decided to expel the Chinese diplomat in question, and that was the right decision. The Honorable Member for Trois-Rivières. Well, Mr. Speaker, not only are the Liberals asking us to believe that they didn't know anything against the, th they didn't know anything about the threats against the member for Wellington Halton Hills in 2021, they also say that they weren't aware of the other regrettable actions of this diplomat, even though that was known since 2020, and they're also telling us that. They didn't know that the diplomat was being closely surveilled by CSIS since 2019? I mean, really, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals clearly don't want to act against Chinese interference or cast light on the situation. When will there finally be a public and independent inquiry? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know that my colleague has been following what's happening in this file. He knows that a special rapporteur was appointed, the former Governor General, David Johnston, who is doing his work, and we should let him do his work. He will be coming back to us with recommendations. The Minister for Public Safety is following this closely. And on our side, based on the facts that have been discovered, we decided to declare that this diplomat was persona non grata. Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, for three years, this government knew that a diplomat at Beijing's Toronto consulate was spying on Chinese Canadians and sending information back to Beijing's secret police. At the same time, this government knew that the very same diplomat was targeting a sitting member of parliament. And for three long years, this government did nothing. Either this prime minister is grossly incompetent, or he just doesn't care about protecting Chinese Canadians from Beijing. Which is it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when a foreign government comes at one of us, it comes at all of us. While Conservatives try to politicize and play partisan games, we are taking real action to keep Canadians safe. Mr. Speaker, you have a government here that cares, a government that works off our Canadian values with empathy. And we want to ensure that all members of Parliament move forward working together with our family, our friends, our neighbours, based on those very values. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, I say this to the members opposite. Let's all consider our responsibility to our, citizen, our citizenship versus our responsibility to our politics. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, that answer is an insult to Chinese Canadians. This government expelled one Beijing diplomat after they got caught doing nothing. But it gets worse. According to national security sources, CSIS has provided this government with a list of other Beijing diplomats identified for expulsion because of the threat they pose to Chinese Canadians. How many names are on that list? How many more warnings from CSIS is this government ignoring? Yeah. Minister of Foreign Affairs. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we take the issues of foreign interference extremely seriously. In fact, we took this issue so seriously, we started implementing measures as soon as we took office, something I'd like to remind Canadians Conservatives never did. The Leader of the Opposition actually said, while members want 
want to heckle because they don't want to hear the fact that the leader of the opposition actually admitted when he was Democratic, uh, the Democratic minister, he actually didn't do anything to do with foreign interference because he didn't think it was in his political yes, interest. Sure. We don't believe in that. We're going to take protection to protect our democracy. The Honorable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Minister for Foreign Affairs doesn't want to answer these questions. Mr. Speaker, we learned that this diplomat was being surveilled by CSIS for three years. We know that he targeted a member of parliament two years ago, and that headlined the Globe and Mail, and it took that headline for the government to finally expel the diplomat this week. And now, what do we learn? That the government's own department knew about this since 2020. Why did the Prime Minister let this intelligence officer operate in Canada for three years? How many Canadians fell victim, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Minister of Global Affairs? Mr. Speaker, I think my colleague forgot to pay attention to what was happening at committee yesterday. Jenny Burns, Pierre Polyev's confidant and strategist. One cannot use the proper names of members of parliament. The Honourable Minister, I'll repeat, Jenny Byrne, a strategist and confident for the leader of the opposition, someone who has his ear, she said at committee yesterday that, in fact, when the leader of the opposition was minister for democratic institutions, he never did anything about foreign interference. So we will not take any lessons from our conservative colleagues on this. We will be there to take action for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Mr. Speaker, it's pathetic. Globe and Mail sources led to the expulsion of the diplomat in less than one week, even though the Minister of Foreign Affairs knew about it for three weeks. Her own department, and even more shocking, we now know that the Department of Foreign Affairs had a list of diplomats since 2020 whose expulsion could be considered because of their participation in activities of foreign interference and threats outside of their diplomatic functions. Just one expulsion, yet there is a list of Beijing operators who continue their dubious activities in the country, and yet the minister is not taking this seriously. When will she finally protect all Canadians from diplomats who are still in their position? The Honourable Leader... The in opposition is a critic to public safety, uh, and we were watching the horrors that happened to Mr. El Mahdi, Mr. El Melki, and Mr. Nuruddin. Uh, and we were reviewing the recommendations of Justice O'Connor and Justice Yacobucci, and there were calls, critical calls then, for the government to act, to create an oversight committee of parliamentarians that could look into every aspect of security and intelligence. The Conservatives refused to act. Even in the wake of those tragedies, they refused to move year after year year after year. When our government came in, we made sure that happened, and that's why they could see every piece of intelligence, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's Green Belt is a world-class program that protects critical farmland, wetlands, and forests, yet the Ontario Premier, Doug Ford, thinks the Green Belt is a scam. Well, you know what else some people think a scam is? Invest inviting developers to donate to your daughter's wedding is a scam. And then handing over the Green Belt to these same conservative connected donors is a scam. So when will this federal government take action under the Impact Assessment Act to prevent the corrupt Doug Ford developer scam from further selling out our environment? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that we can all be proud of in this place is that we put in a National Urban Park in Rouge Urban National Park, which is an amazing jewel for our city. It is something that we have worked on and that we protect. It has species that are very important and endangered that we protect within that space. We have started a study through the Impact Assessment Agency to make sure that we're taking into account all possible impacts on that park. And we will always be there to support our urban green spaces that are so important to us. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. According to a media report, nurses are leaving the public health care system in droves and returning through private job placement agencies. The health care crisis is getting worse under the Liberals' watch. Poor work conditions, low wages, forced overtime, and high patient-to-nurse ratios is causing burnt out. The structural problems must be addressed, and Budget 2023 missed the mark. 
Will the Liberals work with the provinces to ensure nurses get the respect, resources and support they need so that patients can get the care they deserve? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for the question and take this opportunity to acknowledge that this week is National Nurses Week. So I'd like to thank every nurse from coast to coast to coast, including our Minister of Seniors, I might just say. But there are others, and nurses do absolutely imp- uh, the most important work, and, uh, and uh, it's a very, very thankless position sometimes. So I would like to thank them. To the substantive question, Mr. Speaker, nurses deserve fair wages. They deserve a, a, a safe environment for work. They deserve better work conditions, and that's why budget... 2023 invests $198.6 billion in our health care system, including better wages for those who care for the most vulnerable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pierre, Pierre Fondelor. Mr. Speaker, in recent days, many Canadians have expressed deep concern over the developing political crisis in Pakistan. This in the wake of the violent arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Thanks to our strong people-to-people ties, most Canadians have a family member friend or neighbor with deep links to Pakistan. There is real concern about what this unrest means for loved ones overseas and for the region generally. Can the Minister of Foreign Affairs tell this House what the Government of Canada is doing about these events? Minister of Foreign Affairs. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague from Pierre Fondelard, a fantastic writing. Uh, for his important question. The recent images of the Inran Khan arrest are deeply troubling. And so we are uh, very preoccupied with the political crisis that is happening right now in Pakistan. And we're monitoring the situation very closely. And I'm receiving regular updates. Of course, Canada will always stand up for human rights, for the rule of law, for democratic values, and free and fair elections. And so we'll continue to engage on this very issue with Pakistan and, of course, with the community here in Canada. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, this past month, a constituent's bill for natural gas was $168.50. The federal carbon tax was $30.78. This is more than the individual charges for delivery, transportation costs, and HST. Under this government, it's evident that the life costs more for Canadians with the rising costs of gas, heat, and food. How are regular Canadians supposed to keep up? Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister get rid of the carbon tax and prioritize the financial needs of Canadians? Here, here, here. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for that question because it gives me an opportunity again to talk a bit about how carbon pricing works. And let's be clear that the way that carbon pricing works is that every bit of that money that comes to the, through the carbon price is returned to the province, that is to the families in the province, as well as to the hospitals, the schools and the cities in the province of Ontario. Every penny goes back, supports people in her community. We as a government are, in addition, providing supports to Canadians, be it through the dental benefits, be it through child care, be it through Canada, uh, the child benefit. We are there to support Canadians. The Honourable Member for Calgary Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, the cost of government is driving up the cost of living, and now the Liberals plan a 41 cent a litre tax on gas, groceries, and home heating. <laughs> Liberal deficits are driving up inflation, which means higher interest rates, which make mortgages more expensive and harder to qualify for. Prices have doubled, down payments have doubled, rents have doubled, and new housing construction is falling because of high interest rates and red tape. When will this government stop increasing taxes? Stop its inflationary deficit and let the builders build. Yeah. Yeah. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, it's a little hard to take conservatives seriously when they talk about affordability. When we have several affordability measures that are in front of the Finance Committee right now, and instead of talking about those measures, they've turned them away. They've been filibustering for 23 hours. Food banks were scheduled to visit us. We we wanted to hear from them. The Bloc wanted to hear from them. The NDP wanted to hear from them. The cons, they wanted to talk to themselves. Stop the filibuster, let's get to work. There you go. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. This Prime Minister's tax and spend policies are driving up the cost of everything, and now he has plans to push the tax on gas to 41 cents a litre. What happened to his promises to help the middle class? Like Brandon from Langley, who wrote to me recently, I am one of many middle class citizens getting pushed down to the lower class. So here's my question for the Prime Minister. Will he reverse course 
Will he stop the never-ending tax increases and finally stand up for the middle class? The Honorable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, there's one thing that we know for certain. When it comes to Canadians, Conservatives will always hold them back. They voted against the CCB. They voted against dental care. They voted against, against rental supports. They voted against everything, including child care, at a certain point, Mr. Speaker. They tore up the agreements from the previous government when we were in power. Mr. Speaker, what we know about Conservatives is during their time, 2.7 million more Canadians were in poverty than they are today. We have 450,000 more children out of poverty today than when they were in power. Mr. Speaker, they keep holding Canadians back. We're lifting them up. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lillette, Kamouraska, rivière du loup Mr. Speaker, Canadians can't take it anymore. We've said it again and again in every way. But this Prime Minister, what's he doing? Well, he plans to further increase the carbon tax, which, contrary to what he says, will have consequences everywhere in Canada and especially in Quebec. Now, everyone will be impacted by this. Farmers and truckers will have to pay even higher costs, which means that all Canadians at the end of the day will have to pay the price and pay more. So will this Prime Minister wake up and drop his disastrous policies? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, re I can reassure my colleague across the way that our government has not stopped working tirelessly and relentlessly to help Canadians. Mr. Speaker, as you know, in the 2023 budget, we have measures to tax the wealthiest Canadians. We are moving ahead with our 2% tax, uh, buy, stock buyback tax and taxing dividends. Mr. Speaker, we are ready to do all that. And what are the Conservatives doing? Well, they're blocking, obstructing, filibustering. Mr. Speaker, I encourage my colleagues to get to work. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, the federal courts are short 85 judges, which is leading to stays of proceedings against criminals. That is the warning of Richard Wagner, Supreme Court Chief Justice, in a letter obtained by Radio Canada. Liberal ministers are accountable for these delays because they have always interfered with appointments. They filter candidates through Elections Canada data to find liberal donors. They consult with each other among liberals to find out who's part of the liberal family. When will they stop wasting time on partisanship and appoint missing judges based on their qualifications? Minister of Justice. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has appointed more than 600 judges since November 2015. We appoint judges to the bench more efficiently than any other government, and yet we know it is still not enough. We're working to f fill vacancies in various provinces. We spoke with members of the judiciary as well as the bar to encourage more people to apply to the bench. We will continue to make appointments at a steady rate, and the number of vacancies will continue to decline, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, delays in judicial appointments remind us of the following coincidence in 2019. The process resulted in six judges being appointed in New Brunswick. Five of six were close to the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Three were his donors. There was his brother-in-law's wife and his neighbor. Obviously, as a result, it's more difficult today to appoint judges. We can no longer count on the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Mr. Speaker. He has done his part. But, Mr. Speaker, a question. Wouldn't justice be better served by an impartial, independent appointment process at arm's length for ministers and based solely on competence? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It goes without saying that appointments are nonpartisan and independent. It's important because we are a country with the rule of law. We can all agree on that. It's a priority for us as well to ensure that our appointments are representative of the Canadian population so that the bench is representative of Canadians. We will work with the judicial system. We will work with various representatives of society and government. We will also work with the Justice Minister, who is the first Justice Minister to have named so many judges in the history of Canada. So this is a priority for us and will continue to be a priority. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, disturbing reports from the National Post show that the Liberal NDP way of drug safe supply is actually subsidizing harm.
It states the government's approach has, quote, caused the street price of hydromorphone, the primary opioid dispensed at safer supply sites, to drop an estimated 70 to 95 percent in cities with safer supply programs, unquote. This illegal resale market is flooding streets with dangerous drugs. When will the Liberals stop these black markets and end their harmful drug policies? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Mental Health Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government takes uh, diversion of regulated substances very seriously. This is a very worrisome issue, and it, this can apply to all prescription medications and safe supply substances. Healthcare professionals, as well as those who manage safe supply, must follow a federal policy on regulated substances, including rules to prevent diversion. We will continue to prioritize this and take necessary action as needed. Colonial country. Mr. Speaker, it's disturbing to see that member not take seriously the addiction and drug overdose deaths that are continuing to rise. Shame. It's being reported patients take their government-supplied drugs off-site, and this is fueling a new black market that is driving street drug prices down. Physicians are saying this is even leaving, leading to a rise in new addictions, particularly among youth and individuals in recovery. When will the Liberals stop fueling addiction and stop their harmful drug policies? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, will you take an evidence-based approach to solve the, for the addictions epidemic and the poisoned opioid crisis that's having such a devastating impact on our community? Mr. Speaker, it's been really alarming over the last couple of weeks to hear the, the members from the Conservative Party blaming addicts, people who use drugs for this crisis, Mr. Speaker. We take an evidence-based, a science-first approach. Their fact-free approach is absolutely atrocious, and it's going to lead to more harm. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Regina, Wiscana. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, the Prime Minister is out of touch and Canadians are out of money. Right. Once fully implemented, the Liberal carbon tax will cost Canadians an additional 41 cents for a litre of gas, wow. driving up the cost of groceries even higher and sending even more Canadians to the food bank for their next meal. Mr. Speaker, when is this Liberal government going to cancel their inflation-causing carbon tax? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, one of the things I have a hard time with with these questions is that carbon pricing is in fact a market mechanism. What it does is it encourages industry to be more efficient and to be to reduce their emissions. What that does is it actually makes them more competitive in a world where that's exactly what people are looking for. I would expect my members opposite to be supportive of anything we can do to help our industry be at the cutting edge in green technologies, which, by the way, we are. The Honourable Member for Laval. Les Îles. Mr. Speaker, forests and trees purify the air that we breathe. They improve water quality, they promote biodiversity, and they help cool our urban centers. Their ability to capture and store carbon makes them an effective natural means to combat climate change. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Climate Change tell the House what the government is doing to promote and to support projects to plant new trees? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for his question. We know that one of our best allies in the fight against climate change is nature. On Wednesday, at the Montreal Climate Summit, Canada's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change announced a $40 million investment from the federal $2 billion tree program in three projects that will plant a total of 275,000 trees in Montreal and in vaudreuil dorion Planting over a quarter of a million trees in Montreal is sure to contribute to the happiness of residents and the health of the planet. Member for Costa Bay Central Notre Dame. 
Mr. Speaker, Japan and South Korea, tremendous allies and trading partners, partners, are choosing cheap Russian crab over crab caught by our fishermen. As a result, the Newfoundland and Labrador snow crab industry is at a standstill. In 2022, according to the Japan Times, Japan imported a record $1.6 billion worth Canadian of Russian seafood. The biggest import in that category was snow crab at 40 million pounds. So why has this Liberal government failed to convince our Asian friends to ban Russian crab and to defund dictators and support jobs for Canadian fishermen? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canada is known for its sustainable, ethical, and premium quality snow crab, and it's thanks to Canada's hardworking fish harvesters. That's why we're taking a Team of Canada approach, working closely with industry and Atlantic provinces, and raising these concerns with our Japanese counterparts. Our government, Mr. Speaker, has proven this time and time again. We will stand up for Canadian fish and seafood sector, the fishers that work it, and will help to help, help export the top quality products around the world. Paul <laughs> Member for Coast of Bay, Central Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what that government's proven time and time again, is that they're a complete failure. The U.S. banned the importing of Russian crab in June of 2020. This Liberal government has been aware of the continued Japanese and Korean purchasing of snow crab from Russia and was warned of the effect that it would have last October. Our trade deficit with Japan and South Korea combined is at least $5 billion. So while the Prime Minister is jet setting to Japan and South Korea next week, will he convince our allies to follow suit with the U.S. to ban Russian crab, defund dictators, and support paychecks for Canadian fishermen? The Honourable Minister for Export Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I uh, applaud the passion for uh, fishermen because we do too on this side. We stand up for Canadian fishers. We stand up for Canadian industries. We have issued sanctions against Russia. We stand up for Ukraine. Absolutely, this is an issue that is on our radar. And I'm not going to take any lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to good trade deals and standing strong so that we can have terrific trade with our trading partners all around the world. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Mr. Speaker, meeting notes obtained via access to information reveal that the union representing prison staff is alarmed that at Corrections Canada's existing prison farm, staff are required to work with inmates after hours in unsafe conditions that include being alone and unaccompanied and being denied the personal paging devices necessary to call for immediate backup. The union's fears include, and I quote, the potential for assault and hostage taking. If the government can't provide safe working conditions at its existing relatively small prison farm, how will it do so at its planned vast new goat and cow milking operation? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's a good opportunity right now, and I want to I appreciate the question to reflect on a lot of the work that the minister is doing right now, this being one of them, working with our partners to ensure a lot of what the minister or the member brings up is being dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, sports development of children, fostering physical fitness, teamwork, discipline and resilience, while also promoting overall health and well-being. And our Canadian athletes contribute to our national unity, cultural diversity and pride. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Sport tell this House, the parents who have children participating in sports and our athletes at the national and international levels, the strong measures our government is taking to ensure responsible cultural change Canadians want to see in sports, a culture that will benefit the safety and well-being of our athletes and lead to more success as a system. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday was a really important day in Canadian sport. Our government announced reforms to the Canadian sports system, which will contribute to sustainable culture change through improved government governance and accountability, increased athlete engagement and decision-making, and enhanced safe sport measures right across our country. Better diversity and athlete representation on boards with term limits and resources for athletes to ensure that they get the governance training that they need to be active and productive members of each board. I'd like to thank every athlete and participant who has stepped up bravely to tell their story, contributing to these sport reforms. Mr. Speaker, this has been a heavy lift and a team effort. I want to thank everybody involved. It's a great day for Canadian sport. Honourable Member for Edmonton, Griesma. Sudanese Canadians in my riding in Nam and Hani have been pleading with this government for help. Their families are stuck in Sudan amidst violence and the government is nowhere to be found. 
This government's disorganized evacuation program left people behind with restrictive criteria. Now Inam and Hani agonize over whether they will ever see or hear from their loved ones ever again. Will this government expand and broaden the special immigration measures to allow Sudanese Canadians to bring their loved ones to safety? Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and certainly I thank the member for his question. The situation in Sudan is highly volatile, and we are deeply concerned for the safety of Sudanese people. That's why we've announced that we are introducing immigration measures to support Sudanese nationals in Canada who are unable to return home. We're also providing facilitative measures and expediting process, exp- expediting process of their application free of charge, Mr. Speaker. We are ready to help the people of Sudan and help their family here. Merci. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, newcomers to Canada who apply for permanent residency wait for endless months for the decision that will give them this coveted status. When they finally receive an email telling them that they have been accepted, well, I don't need to tell you that it is a great joy for them. However, there is one problem, although it is 2023. With all the technology and the amount of civil servants we have, the government takes between four to eight months to produce and mail the permanent resident card that allows them to obtain the services that they need and are entitled to. Can the Prime Minister tell us whether we can expect a simple directive to be sent to the Department so that they provide the resident card at the same time as the confirmation of permanent residency? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Immigration Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for his question. We need to be very clear. We are doing everything we can to reduce waiting times and processing times in permanent residency applications. But we also have returned to our 60-day service standard, and in 2022, we welcomed over 437,000 new permanent residents, which is a record since 1913. So, Mr. Speaker, this is good news for Canada. We have modernized the immigration system in Canada, and this modernization means we are doing things well to return to our service standards. We will continue to help those who want to come to Canada and we will help them as fast as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A point of order from the Honourable Member for Red Deer Lacombe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. During question period today, the member for Burnaby North Seymour used uh, language uh, referring to another political party here in a pejorative term. Mr. Speaker, I encourage you to look at the record. If this is the new standard in the House, I'm looking forward to the various things I'll be referring to his party with. I, I believe we will, re- we will review that, but I will remind folks that uh, we have Liberal Party, Conservative Party, Bloc Québécois, New Democratic Party, so the Green Party. So we all have uh, we all have we all have our, our, our names. Uh, the, honor- the honorable parliamentary secretary. Let's, let's, let's point out. Let's not just have a random. Act- today with an update from Colin Blair from the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, followed by Christy Tucker from Alberta Wildfire. We will then take your questions. Go ahead, Colin. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Alberta continues to be under a provincial state of emergency, and the Provincial Emergency Coordination Center remains at level four. In addition to the provincial state of emergency, there are 20 states of local emergency, as well as five band council resolutions and 15 evacuation orders are in place. About 17,431 people remain evacuated at this time, and there are 11 reception centers that have registered evacuees. In the past 24 hours, there have been several changes to the evacuation orders and alerts. The total number of evacuation orders is now at 15, and there are four evacuation alerts in place. Most notably, the town of Valley Valley View just issued an evacuation order this afternoon for all residents in the area. And nearby Sturgeon County, correction, Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation expanded its evacuation order. All residents who have to evacuate should register at the nearest reception center or online. So far, more than 15,624 people are registered. 
Registering will make it easier to get help and resources to evacuees, and it makes it easier for officials to reach residents with important information. The wildfire situation continues to be extremely volatile. Hot and dry conditions throughout much of the province are creating the perfect storm for fires to start and grow quickly, which poses a significant and unpredictable threat to many communities. It's crucial that all Albertans pay close attention to the fire bans that are in place throughout most of the province. As well, those who are driving in any area of the province where there are active wildfires should drive with caution. Smoke is causing poor air quality and reduced visibility. Motorists should drive with caution and check 511 for up-to-date provincial road closures and road conditions. For those who are in a community that's on an evacuation alert, being prepared to evacuate could very well save lives. The situation can change quickly and an evacuation order may be issued at any time with little to no warning. I want to reinforce the importance of people being prepared for themselves, their loved ones and their pets. There's a lot of information on how to prepare for an evacuation on the Alberta government website. Albertans can also find emergency alerts by visiting the emergency alert site. Preparing in advance will keep residents and their loved ones safe. We encourage all Albertans in potentially impacted communities to stay informed by paying attention to emergency alerts and local news updates. Get information only from trusted and verified sources. Follow your local authority's social media accounts and download the Alberta Emergency Alert app. Residents should also remember to stay connected with neighbours and community members. Contact from friends and neighbours during an emergency can help everyone stay safe and feel supported. In their preparation, it is crucial to pack an emergency kit that will last for a week or more with essential items like medications, identification, a first aid kit, flashlights, batteries, non-perishable food, cash and clothing. This kit should be kept in an accessible location and we urge people to have a plan for their pets. They should consider how they'll gather and transport their pets, where their pets will go and what supplies they will need including food, medications, leashes and carriers. Albertans can find more tips and information online at alberta.ca. We have also heard from Albertans who are concerned about the security of their home and property if they must evacuate. The Alberta RCMP website has tips on how, how Albertans can protect their properties in advance of being evacuated and it includes updates on what the RCMP is doing in specific areas. Those in affected areas by wildfires are encouraged to opt in for this free voluntary system. We know parents and students have been worried about how the evacuations and school, school closures will affect upcoming diploma exams. Alberta Education has been working closely with all affected school divisions to continually assess the situation and what that means for student learning. A decision has been made to automatically exempt students affected by wildfire evacuations from writing diploma exams if they have been displaced from school for 10 days or more. I'll say that again. If they have been displaced from school for 10 or more school days. This means that a student who has been displaced from a school as a result of the wildfire for 10 or more school days is automatically exempted from writing their diploma exams this June and not have it count against their final grades. Students can choose to write their the diploma in a different community in June or can choose to write the exam in August if they don't want the exemption. By providing options we are giving flexibility to students and parents who are facing pressure as the evacuations continue. These are trying times and the coming days may be quite difficult. We are doing all we can to protect communities at risk, but all Albertans need to remain vigilant and closely follow updates on the current wildfire conditions. 
The safety of Albertans, their families, and their communities depends upon it. I urge Albertans to download the Alberta Emergency Alert app to their mobile devices to receive emergency alerts and important information. These are just a few key updates, but more information on how to prepare and emergency alerts are available online at alberta.ca slash emergency. We continue to work closely with local officials and responders in all affected communities to get personnel, resources, and equipment where they are needed. Finally, I want to remind evacuees that we do have a nightly telephone town hall they can join. The call begins at 7.30 p.m. and provide a great opportunity for evacuees to get the information they need. They can join the town hall by calling 1-833-380-0691. Thank you. And I will now turn things over to Christy from Alberta Wildfire for more information on the provincial wildfire situation. Thank you, Colin. There are currently 90 wildfires in the forest protection area of Alberta. 23 of those wildfires are out of control. So far this year, we've responded to 465 wildfires burning nearly 532,000 hectares. You can always get up-to-date numbers uh, as things change by accessing our interactive map on the Alberta wildfire status page. Well, the weekend was a challenging one for firefighters and many Albertans may have observed more smoke in the air from active wildfires. Smoke can impact visibility, making it difficult to assess wildfires. And the wind is expected to change today, which could lead to unpredictable wildfire behavior. It could also affect the movement and intensity of wildfires. Winds are expected to shift from the southeast to the northwest with gusts of up to 50 kilometers an hour. Combined with the heat and dryness, this will cause dangerous conditions for our firefighters on the ground. We are watching conditions closely as they can change very quickly with hourly reports on the progress of the weather. Tomorrow, strong northerly winds and gusts are expected to continue with little precipitation expected. But we have 900 firefighters and support staff joining more than 1,600 from Alberta wildfire for a combined total of 2,500 people battling wildfires in Alberta. And that's not to mention the many more municipal and county firefighters who are working to protect their communities. Again, this is not the time for complacency. All Albertans need to remain vigilant to the threat of wildfires, even in those areas with a lower wildfire activity. Under these conditions, a wildfire can start and spread easily anywhere in the province. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We will begin with questions here in the room and then move to the phones.